Be glad and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy all who are true of heart. Amen. Our guide this morning is a 10-year-old, brown-eyed, bright and hopeful little girl. The year is 1960, post-World War II Germany. She's motioning to us to come along as she rides her bike south along the east bank of the Rhine River. The bridge at Bon Boyle has been built back, the same at Koblenz. She points out barges carrying freight from the Ruhrgebiet to Frankfurt. We pass a park together and her favorite place to stop for ice cream. Suddenly, she she veers to the right and asphalt gives way to cobblestone. Moments later, we land on the steps of the medieval village church that towers over the market square, unscarred from late war countryside skirmishes. There's energy and color and sights and sounds and vegetable vendors everywhere. She wants a donut. So we stop for a Bellina at a local bake shop. Refreshed and ready for more, she tugs at my jacket sleeve and we're off again. This time, we're dodging cats and dogs and baby buggies and pidges and puddles and all those things that 10-year-olds just dare to get in their way. One more left-hand turn back towards the river, and we begin to pass through this gorgeous residential neighborhood, lined with the flags of countries from around the world, Peru and Italy and Argentina, Canada, the United Kingdom, and then there, right at the end of the street, an American flag outside what we can clearly see is the American embassy. She stops outside the gate. And after a lengthy period of time, watching Marines and traffic and suited diplomats with families and the brand new pristine Bauhaus influenced steel and mirror buildings of the compound, she turns to us and says simply, Dankeschön, thank you. Now it's a schoolgirl's view. She can't possibly have any idea. The Marshall Plan, the rebuilding of Europe, it's being coordinated from inside that building. She, She has no notion of the war and its horrors. She does know that that slowly and surely the streets, the the rubble streets of her life that have been torn apart are coming back together. And she does know that somehow saying thank you to those who come and go at this compound was part of what locals did to acknowledge the role that the United States was playing in bringing Germany back from the brink of oblivion. Dankeschön. Even though embassies do not actually occupy sovereign soil of the sending country, we should be clear that embassies do in every way represent the people, the culture, the way of life, and worldviews of the sending country in a way that makes it completely compelling to the host country. It was a colloquial association that led our guide, who no doubt recognized our American accents, to take us to the American embassy and say thank you. I'm grateful for this little detour this morning. As we find ourselves in the midst of this capital campaign celebration Sunday at Christ Church, taken in conjunction with the witness of Paul in his second letter to the church at Corinth, it seems that a moment such as this requires that you lean in and take the counsel both of Paul and of our guide. So we are ambassadors for Christ, 
Paul writes, since God is making his appeal through us. Paul means to suggest in this passage that there's an ambassador-like quality to the work Christians have to do. Every one of us. Our churches are outposts of the kingdom of God, cultivating a witness in this strange and foreign land for the disciples of Christ, for their way of life, for their worldview, and for their representation of the homeland. If the world is riven by strife and division, then the church, and specifically Christ Church here at 9th and Broadway, the church must speak for reconciliation and healing. If the world will recognize and honor the strong, the eloquent, the powerful, and the elegant, then the church, and specifically Christ Church, will stand with the least, the last, the lost, and the dead. Inside these doors... Inside these doors, the last will be first. And if the world will honor heroes that leap tall buildings in a single bound or worship gods of power and wealth and immortality, then the church, specifically Christ church, will fall only to her knees before the cross of our dying God as Jesus takes on every horror and sin that the world can conjure. We, we're ambassadors for this way of life. We populate this embassy, this outpost of the kingdom of God, and stand ready to provide for its work in the decades to come. Seven years ago, we, we started a series of church-wide gatherings and studies that would give rise to our current strategic plan for ministry. As a community, we discerned under the guidance of the Holy Spirit that for our ambassador-like work to thrive in the coming decades, we would need to invest more in the work of fellowship, youth, and outreach. The announcement of the strategic plan about two and a half years ago gave rise to its implementation and the study of what changes our campus required. And picking up on the master plan work of earlier decades, the vestry and its appointed committees agreed that a new and larger and more easily accessible fellowship hall built with modern sensibilities would be the first priority. Followed then by the movement of the youth program from the lower level of the 810 building back onto the main campus. And finally, with the building and renovating of space for outreach, outreach of our current ministries and of those yet to be imagined. Readiness and architectural studies led the vestry to hire a local architect. We've now hired that EOA to be the architect of record to help site and design the new fellowship hall. That work is underway. A capital campaign committee was formed and a coordinator hired. Initial cost estimates of a master plan completely built out came in at $16 million. Feasibility and readiness studies helped the vestry to discern and set a campaign goal of $8 million to accomplish the first priorities of the strategic plan. Mary and Charlie Cook, Donna and Hal Johnson, along with their committee members and the coordinator, have done extraordinary work, Holy Spirit-inspired work, to get us to the point where the $8 million goal set by the vestry is now in sight. We're 80% of the way there towards that goal. And the last 20% will be accomplished when you step in and join us. It may be that you've never given to a campaign like this before, where you've been asked to step up as an individual and join with those around you to work for the common good. Well, now is your time. God's calling on each of you, each of us, to put our shoulders to the plow that God's dream for Christ Church might become reality. Yes, this community needs to raise the $8 million for the first phase of this work, but just as important is the second prong of the goal, 100% participation in the effort from every one of us. No, no shrinking towards the back pew, or no, no, no passing of the plate without your card. This work needs you. <clears throat> the vestry members of the last three gener that cycles are all in. Your commission and committee chairs are all in. Your clergy are in. Uh, almost another 200 households of this congregation are in. And today I call upon you, those of us gathered here to celebrate the work accomplished this 
milestone and to lay it before the throne of God by means of our cards that make pledges, that note our thanksgivings, that name our hopes, and the many ways in which this embassy outpost has blessed your life. Even while this campaign is, is underway, our financial commitment to the least, the last, and the lost has not been compromised. It gives me great joy to note that just this last Sunday, your vestry, while deeply committed to the capital campaign, also appropriated funds to help the Reconciliation Family Center with purchase of its guest house and to help the Diocese of Haiti with its building of a school at Boc Bonique. We can and will raise funds for capital improvement and continue our service to the marginalized because we will not be limited by imagination and we will not be limited by restricted views of what's possible. When you came in today, you were, you were handed a card and an envelope. In, in just a few moments, the, the choir will, will sing for us. They've prepared an anthem just for this moment. And during that time, they sing and present the anthem. You're asked to fill out that card. There are children sitting with you in the pew. They could, they could be drawing on the envelope on the outside, or there's also a pink card enclosed. They could write something there. If you've already recorded a pledge to the campaign, please note that on your card. If you've been waiting until now to make your pledge, please write the detail on your card. There's a five-year fulfillment period that you might take into account as you write in your pledge. If you're new today and have no idea what you've stumbled into, God bless you. <laughs> God bless you. It's a place where stuff's happening. If you'd like to speak to a member of the clergy or to a member of the campaign committee, write that down on the card as well. And if you finish early, while the choir's still singing, then take that pink card if it hasn't been used yet and write down your own hope or a prayer or a blessing or just some note of how this place has blessed you. Be outrageously generous. If the, if the world operates from the vantage of scarcity, then disciples of Christ operate from the vantage of abundance in the knowledge that God will provide for what God requires. Be outrageously generous. We all have many charities to support, and over these next five years, between your pledge to the campaign and a pledge to the annual ministries of the church, this community will become the primary object of your giving, and your tithe and campaign offering will point you to where your heart belongs, here at the center of this kingdom outpost. When you finish, just slip it back in the envelope along with anything you've written on the pink card and later during the offertory the ushers will come by and take up your envelopes along with the Sunday offering. So Michael if you could be, be wonderful, bless you and if so I'll take just a couple of moments during this anthem to contemplate how you will respond to this time and make use of your cards.
just one more word. Our guide is back. The year is 2040, 2040. She's now 90 years old. Turns out she married one of those Marines and moved to Middle Tennessee in the mid-70s. Today she's asking us to push her in her wheelchair. She wants to show us the Nashville of tomorrow. Walking up Lower Broadway from the Cumberland, the first thing you notice is no traffic. <laughs> Second through Eighth Avenue along Broadway is a pedestrian zone only. Light rail whisks folks from the city center out spokes of the Nashville wheel. Service workers walk to work side by side with those wearing silk stockings, having left from the same apartment building with luxury and workforce housing units side by side. The buildings all around us are taller and greener and more friendly to the environment, dependent on renewable energy. Hume Fogg next door added three stories. The honky-tonks and pedal taverns, well, they remain. <laughs> but as we approach Christ Church, our guide asks us to slow down and then to stop. The exterior is similar to what she remembered from the 1970s. But now she shows us lines have formed around the buildings old and new. One day to serve soup, the next for an organ concert, the next for worship, the next to pray for the soul of one who has died and to offer comfort, the next for the baptism of little ones and for new believers, the next for the debate of candidates for mayor, the next for a wedding and the reception, the next for refugees seeking sanctuary, and the next for the visit of a presiding bishop. There are colors and sights and sounds and joy and the certain confidence that good news lives at the corner of Ninth and Broadway and in the heart of Nashville. Our guide grabs my sleeve and pulls me in and points to the open door. And she says, Da lebt die Christen. That's where the Christians live. Dankeschön.